Uh, thanks, Dennis, for inviting me to this uh, very significant project. Um, I suppose, um, you know, UK is facing the problem with uh, unity uh, in the post-Brexit era. Um, so in Chinese, we call, you know, to get ready uh, for the rainy days, which is a good idea. But unfortunately, um, I'm afraid that China doesn't really have a lot of positive experience to offer. Um, so I come here with a mind that uh, lessons could also be useful. Um, so my topic today is how to keep parts together in uh, what is obviously a very big country. Okay. Well, it's not exactly easy for China to maintain the unification in history. And uh, uh, our history has been going through cycles of unity and division. So it's a famous novel called The Story of Three Kingdoms says that uh, it's almost a matter of regularity that a nation will under undergo cycles of uh, uh, unity and division. So if it's united for too long, it will be divided. If it's divided for too long, it will be united, okay, which is um, um, the history of China. But uh, that sounds easy, uh, not exactly, because at almost every turn uh, of dynasties in China, uh, we suffer from a uh, very heavy loss of human life and property, uh, very heavy destruction to the nation. So China uh, began its unification um, at least since 220 BC, uh, when our first dynasty was um, initiated by the so-called first emperor, uh, Qin Shi Huang. So he um, managed to unite uh, several uh, feudal fiefdoms to a centralized state, which pretty much lasts through today. Because today, when we talk about China's constitutional system, it is a unitary constitutional system. Okay, the well, institutionally speaking, it's almost as the same as our first dynasty. Okay. And um, incredibly, in the Chinese long, which means over 2000, um, by now, what, 2020 some years, um, un unitary system has always been the case. We have never have a state uh, where we have a truly federal system, okay. Um, well, China uh, in its later days was uh, governed by the minority uh, rules. Um, as, as you know, you know, China has a reasonably complicated uh, ethnic makeups uh, throughout our history. So around 1300, uh, um, the Mongolians uh, managed to conquer China uh, in the Yuan dynasty. And the last dynasty is the Qin. Uh, only one letter um, difference from the first dynasty and the Qin. It's a very fine difference in Chinese. So dynasty, uh, the last dynasty was ruled by Manchu from uh, 1636 to 1911 when the first Republican uh, revolution occurred. Um, and uh, uh, since then, China also went through a couple of uh, cycles between unity and division. There was um, um, division among uh, the feudal warlords in the early years of Republican time before the Nationalist Party Kuomintang um, succeeded in unified China through the Northern Expedition around the 1927-28. Okay, so after uh, 1949, China is uh, further 
centralized, okay, under the communist regime. Um, but we still have conflicts, you know, um, geopolitical conflicts, mostly along ethnic and political lines. And as you well know, uh, as you well know, um, Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, uh, and Taiwan um, were the current um, problems often talk about related to uh, the unity of China. Um, so 1959, uh, there's a, a, a major political event when Dalai Lama fled to uh, India uh, after a conflict between him and Mao occurred. And um, uh, during the um, 1960s, uh, the, uh, a, a general, a Chinese general, uh, maintained order in Xinjiang province and the so-called construction squads, Jianzi uh, Bintuan, is still uh, present in Xinjiang, which is a very special system. And uh, well into two year 2000s, there are also a uh, uh, few um, ethnic conflicts in Tibet and Xinjiang and the latest we see uh, massive protest in Hong Kong. So it has not been peaceful, but overall, um, since 1949, China has been able to maintain unity, uh, I would say at a very high cost, all right? Uh, so our latest constitution is enacted in uh, 1982, which um, has this combined feature of local autonomy uh, plus ethnic equality. Uh, and um, in order to uh, welcome Hong Kong and Macau, the two special administrative uh, regions to um, uh, come back, the constitution especially authorized our National People's Congress, the highest legislative institution to enact the basic laws uh, for Hong Kong and Macau. And in 84, there was a uh, joint declaration between China and the UK, which defined a very special one country to system regime. So, so all of this is quite interesting. And I would say that it will work pretty well, uh, both for the minor, ethnic minorities and also for these special regions for Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, Hong Kong's one country two system is uh, instituted as an example to unify Taiwan, hopefully in the future, but um, up to now it has been uh, 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 a total failure. Um, so, how do we manage uh, up to today a, a, uni a unified country with uh, ethnically and culturally uh, diversity um, in such a big nation? And um, how exactly does the so-called autonomous uh, nationality uh, system work? And how special is uh, the special ministry of region? And what are their uh, inherent limitations, uh, which um, keeps China from uh, sustainably maintaining peace and uh, harmony uh, in these regions. So that's all what I'm gonna talk about um, in um, a very brief talk today. So here is the uh, ethnic map of China. Okay, as you can see, um, the ethnic, uh, minority regions are concentrated along the borders. All right, the orange is Tibet, the uh, pink, Xinjiang, and the yellow in the Mongolia, which used to be peaceful, but um, due to mishandling of some uh, cultural policies, uh, it could also, you know, um, turn up with um, uh, problems. Um, Hong Kong and Macau is somewhere located between Taiwan, uh, which is this uh, green spot in the lower uh, right corner, and uh, uh, Hainan Island in the south. Okay, they are too small to be seen, but they are somewhere there, and uh, their small size should not diminish their significance to China's unity.
Okay, now, uh, first of all, the, nation, the nationality regional autonomy. Um, so China has, according to our official statistics, uh, 56 ethnic minorities, which we call the nationalities, uh, a term borrowed from the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, they constitute roughly about 8% of total population, which means the dominant uh, race, uh, the Han ethnicity, constitute about 92% of the population. And the uh, minorities are distributed in um, several specially designated uh, areas. The biggest area are the region, autonomous regions. There are five. Okay, Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, uh, Ningxia, and Guangxi. Uh, so they are at the provincial level, but uh, there are also some uh, sub-provincial units, like prefectures and counties, uh, which are designated as um, um, the nationality regional place, which is a more gen uh, generic term uh, for these areas. So uh, uh, add together, they cover about 44 nationalities out of 56 uh, and uh, 6 million uh, population, which is not really big uh, compared uh, to China's uh, total population. But they, uh, they do occupy a very um, a large geographical span, uh, about 60% of territories. Uh, so, uh, still, as you can see, we have about 12 ethnic minorities uh, which are spread out in uh, other areas, you know, just mingling along, uh, together with a high uh, ethnicity. Uh, so, this ethnic relationships is very important for China's um, uh, peace and harmony. And the 82 Constitution uh, does take special care to, to, to make peace. Um, in Article 4, especially uh, uh, provided for the, all these nationalities to have freedom to use and develop their own language and keep their own customs. Uh, in uh, Article 113 and 114, uh, define, uh, reserve certain positions, the leadership positions for minorities. So for example, uh, as you can see uh, in the upper picture, the, um, uh, the chairman of uh, uh, Tibet um, ethnic uh, region, the uh, nationality region, has to be a Tibetan, a uh, native Tibetan, okay. Uh, but the Party secretary for Tibet has to be Han, okay? So uh, there is a delicate balance between the ethnicities in order to make sure that these ethnicities, particularly uh, Tibet and Xinjiang, the, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang are satisfied. So they have a certain sense of belonging uh, to the nation. Uh, on the other hand, the Communist Party would uh, keep safe control over these regions. Okay, and um, uh, these nationality autonomous place may also have some freedom to enact um, autonomous uh, regulations or ordinance called Tiao Li, which may deviate from centralized laws in order to, to take the local customs into consideration. Okay, so anyway, um, uh, some diversity, uh, some autonomy, okay. Um, but there's also a, um, a very pervasive concern for centralized control and uh, uh, maintenance of uh, unity. Um, I would say overall, the um, autonomy of these um, uh, nationality autonomous uh, places are uh, very limited and perhaps uh, not so necessary um, if we can guarantee uh, democracy and the local autonomy, particularly if we adopt certain 
federal system, uh, which would uh, delegate a lot of power uh, to, you know, not only these um, nationality places, but also to uh, regular provinces in general, uh, and make sure that uh, these local subunits are democratically elected as defined in the constitution, uh, then um, the ethnic relationship could be better, uh, more peaceful than um, it is now. So uh, as I described, you know, this overall guarantee for local autonomy and uh, ethnic specialty diversity uh, is not terribly unique. Uh, and I'm not sure how these ethnic minorities feel, you know, about um, uh, the cultural political rights you enjoy. Definitely not so much political rights, and which is not, you know, not enjoyed in <clears throat> these special regions, nor in other great provinces uh, dominated by the Han uh, ethnicity. It is at least arguable, I think, that. <clears throat> Um, the current model, the China model, is not necessarily better than the melting pot model in America, um, where the um, citizens um, of different ethnic groups are in principle equally treated, <clears throat> you know, well, plus some special um, uh, privileges uh, under the name, for example, affirmative action, which we do have, you know, for example, in the university admission program, you know, we do allocate special quota to Tibet, to Xinjiang and the minority um, uh, regions. But our general problem is that these positive measures are not based upon the guarantee of negative measures. That is, you know, the, um, um, the central government would have to obey, would have to follow the constitution to respect the political, uh, cultural, um, including economic rights of these um, um, local, special uh, local ethnic places. And as a result, we see uh, unrest and repressions in Xinjiang, Tibet, and uh, lately in Inner Mongolia as well. <clears throat> and they are caused by obvious constitutional violations of personal freedoms. As you see in Xinjiang, you probably know uh, more or even much more than I do uh, in China uh, because uh, of the the limits to the information we could receive uh, on the internet. Um, so the violations of uh, uh, personal freedoms, uh, equality, um, equal treatments, and uh, language rights, among others. Okay, <clears throat> and what happened in uh, this uh, massive protest in Inner Mongolia, uh, I think occurred Oh, either early this year, or earlier this year or last year, it's because that the state wanted to restrict uh, the language right of the Mongolian students in their primary education. Okay, so uh, some of the parents uh, worried and protested. Had this not been the case, in the Mongolia would have been a perfectly peaceful place, which uh, it ha has been, you know, um, since uh, 1949. Okay, and uh, the unification, the apparent unification was made possible only by uh, repression and uh, total ban of uh, free speech and uh, press. Uh, so there is a lack of basic communication between Han and other ethnic groups. Um, and well, in a short term, this help to maintain peace, but this peace is very superficial because there's hatred, there's fear in these minority groups. Uh, and um, I don't believe that uh, the force can uh, be um, kept, you know, uh, forever, right? Sometime in the future, the pressure would have to be relieved. And then the hatred would, uh, you know, would, would explode, uh, explode. 
<clears throat> and because different ethnicities uh, distrust and uh, don't understand each other. So that would incur further hatred and misunderstandings. So which would make situation worse because um, we would wonder, you know, why these minorities are so dissatisfied? Um, uh, are they just some, you know, occupied by some evil thoughts who simply want to break up and, um, you know, or, or maybe they are uh, incited by uh, these uh, evil uh, international uh, uh, imperialist elements um, in order to break away from China. Uh, a lot of, I would say, the vast majority of Chinese believe this way due to the lack of communication, due to the lack of proper information. Uh, so they don't really know the real cause of ethnic conflict and hatred. Okay, so this is a very dangerous situation, uh, which would um, um, uh, saw the seed for uh, future uh, violent uh, disunity. Okay, um, so to summarize the lessons from China's NRA, uh, uh, the Nationality um, uh, um, Reading Autonomy Practice, I would say that it has been uh, unsuccessful because uh, the constitution fails. And this is just a general feature of China of having a constitution, but without constitutionalism. Okay, I had uh, lectures before on this uh, subject. Um, that is, we do have, a, I think, a reasonably good written constitution. Uh, but the constitution is not implemented uh, for a variety of reasons. And as a result, the unity is not based upon, you know, the protection of constitutional rights of ethnic minorities and uh, the mutual understanding and uh, sufficient communication between different ethnic groups, uh, but rely almost purely on repressive measures, which I don't think uh, UK, uh, countries like UK uh, can afford to take. Um, so this would um, uh, uh, create hatred and uh, fear among ethnic minorities, <clears throat> and the unity would become unsustainable once the pressure is relieved. Okay, so our lesson um, tells that uh, we need to follow the constitutional principles, which uh, are defined in China's constitution, which means local, local autonomy and ethnic uh, equality. <clears throat> and as I already mentioned, some affirmative action may be necessary uh, to help economic development and cultural preservation in these minority areas. Um, so China, uh, I think, is doing reasonably in this uh, later aspects, later aspects, okay. Uh, but not the first two. Uh, of course, you can add further negative rights, such as free speech and press, also, uh, religious freedom uh, are vitally important. Uh, so, you know, deprivation, which will also create hatred and fear. So uh, without the guarantee of these negative rights, then uh, the positive measures would have limits in helping uh, to unite uh, the country. Okay, um, now let me move to our special uh, administrative region, i.e. Hong Kong and Macau, but I would focus on Hong Kong because uh, Macau has been very uh, obedient and uh, quiet uh, since its uh, return to China in 1999, uh, but Hong Kong has not been so uh, since its return in 1997. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, model of autonomy because uh, there is uh, a lot of misunderstanding, okay, between um, of um, uh, the nature of the 
autonomy enjoyed by these two special industry regions, as they are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because some people would argue that uh, Hong Kong should have, you know, a federal system. Well, this only, this is correct only in one aspect, but not correct in other aspects. Because um, uh, the trouble with Hong Kong uh, is caused by this dichotomy between two types of political, uh, types of autonomy, uh, the political autonomy and the legal autonomy, all right? On the legal side, Hong Kong enjoys very high degree of autonomy. The autonomy is much higher than ordinary federal state, okay? Because, um, uh, you know, in, in ordinary federal states such as in, in the United States, uh, the federal laws are uniformly applied to um, all the states or provinces, okay? Same in Canada, Australia. Uh, so the federal power is limited, but once we make sure it's, it's, in the, uh, it's within the constitution limit, then uh, we apply across the whole nation, which is not the case in Hong Kong, um, which also call um, the, the recent measure uh, adopted by mainland into very serious uh, doubt. Okay, well, most of the laws in Hong Kong uh, actually not, I'm, I'm sorry, most of the laws in mainland, okay, so made by National People's Congress, uh, NPC, are not applicable to Hong Kong. So they are applicable only if they are listed under Annex 3 of Hong Kong's basic law. So this is a very different from the ordinary uh, federal state. Uh, and uh, in a sense, Hong Kong uh, enjoys not only um, much higher legal autonomy than United States, but also much higher legal autonomy than uh, uh, unities, uh, uh, units like European Union, which is uh, probably confederal in nature. Okay, and it's very similar to this nullification uh, doctrine uh, in, you know, prior to American Civil War. Now, where South Carolina argue that uh, uh, it has a right to uh, disapply federal laws uh, if it wishes uh, to do that, okay? Uh, which is a case, legitimately is a case for Hong Kong. Um, our national laws, uh, in, as a matter of principle, do not apply to Hong Kong or Macau. But on the other hand, uh, the SARs enjoy uh, much lower political autonomy than federal states. Okay, because uh, um, uh, the chief executive and the major officials in Hong Kong need to be approved by uh, the, our central government. Uh, uh, in other words, the state council. Okay, so in that sense, Hong Kong's political autonomy is even much lower than an ordinary mainland province where its chief executive is elected by its local People's Congress, not appointed, okay, no approval from central government is necessary, all right? So it is precisely because of this dichotomy, the huge dichotomy between political autonomy and legal autonomy that caused trouble in Hong Kong. Um, and of course, this is a, also a highly uh, anonymous arrangement uh, for the one country, uh, two system, specially designed for Hong Kong. So anyway, um, it's a very interesting system uh, and it's a very special um, situation because uh, um, as you all know, uh, China has been a socialist state since 1949. Uh, well, you know, we have major reforms that essentially uh, make us deviate from the you know, Soviet orthodox, but still uh, in its name at, at the very least, you know, it, it is a socialist system. 
what Hong Kong and Macau are so-called capitalist system. So how capitalist system can unite with a socialist system? And that's why we have one country, uh, but two systems, all right? So uh, we have this symbolic unity uh, underneath which we have substantial uh, pluralism, which accommodate you know, different political, economic, and cultural systems. So that's the basic idea of um, uh, one country, uh, two systems. And um, it worked reasonably well uh, since uh, the return in uh, 1997 uh, for Hong Kong and then 1994 uh, Macau. Um, as I mentioned, our constitution uh, authorized uh, the MP MPC to make the basic law for Hong Kong and Macau, which serve as a, a, a petite constitution, basically, you know, uh, only specially applicable to these SARs. Okay, it has nothing to do with uh, any uh, province or local governments in mainland but only specially applied in Hong Kong. Uh, so we have a very sharp division between mainland and SAR. Uh, they, you know, they apply very different systems. So um, Hong Kong and mainland have two different constitutions. You know, actually lately because of uh, uh, conflict is getting more intense and the mainland uh, constitutional uh, scholars are also involved in debate, you know, what's the nature of basic law, is it a separate constitution or it is uh, actually not a constitution but only a law within the, our current constitution uh, for the whole China, I would say that uh, this is basically a uh, sophistry. Uh, yes, um, substantively speaking, we have different constitutions, okay, but True, it is not exactly constitution, it is a special law made by NPC. Actually, just as our constitution is also passed by NPC by special majority, um, so were uh, the basic laws. Okay, but that does not uh, indicate uh, that uh, uh, the basic law is only uh, uh, some, some law, just like other laws for mainland. Okay, so it, it is a separate constitution. Uh, that govern uh, Hong Kong and uh, Macau, um, and it is a basis for all the um, SAR legislations, uh, institutions, and uh, uh, policies. So we should stop debating on which is higher law, whether it's a basic law or constitution. Um, um, well, I mean, there are certainly practical difficulties um, uh, because um, you know, China is not even a, um, a, a federal system. It is a unitary system. So it is very, um, it is hard, you know, to sort of carve out a special region um, uh, like this and apply uh, very special laws. So I would say that it is a very courageous um, practice, but the, the success the sustainability of such practice would rely upon the mutual trust, all right? There is no uh, perfect constitutional arrangement that would um, uh, make it happen uh, just as it is, um, you know. Uh, so um, I would say prior to 2013-14, uh, or 18, the, well, we have a lot of um, uh, grudges with Hong Kong, but overall, uh, they operate uh, smoothly with some mutual respect, if not mutual trust, okay? And so that's how the unity uh, is uh, preserved. But uh, lately, especially since 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2019, um, the situation uh, deteriorated quickly. Okay, so um, well, a very brief review of a high uh, degree of autonomy. Um, it is, you know, I mean, in a way, uh, a social contract between Hong Kong and uh, mainland, 
um, you know, that is, it's a kind of deal between one country and two systems, all right? One country is what mainland China want. You know, we want symbolic unity, okay, which I suppose uh, serve as a very <clears throat> big boost for the legitimacy of the Communist Party. But on the other hand, the Hong Kongese want the two systems. They, they don't want to be assimilated by mainland, all right? So that's a deal. Now, it's a contract between mainland and Hong Kong. I mean, we should view this way, okay? A wise leader would view this way. But unfortunately, uh, uh, this idea of social contract is very alien to China because, you know, just uh, you can see this fact from uh, this anomaly uh, uh, that is, China is the only Side, you know, country of this size that still maintains a, a, a unitary system, albeit you, you know, uh, with pluralism, um, but still, constitutionally speaking, it is unitary, meaning that we're not willing to uh, accept local autonomy. We're not, the central government is not willing to have any kind of uh, uh, equal uh, status with local government or with the government in SAR. Um, and it always wanted to assume this kind of vertical relationship that is, I'm the leader, you are the subordinates. So in which the social contract is um, impossible. And, and I do want to highlight at the very end that this idea of a social contract is very important for a sustainable unity, uh, especially for constitutional uh, uh, democracies like the UK, and uh, uh, any real unity would have to be based upon social contract. That is, it, we have unity only because the people uh, among uh, people of different uh, uh, sides really want it to, to be unified because they feel comfortable living with each other because, you know, this constitutional system would afford them uh, with full freedom. So they have no intention to uh, succeed, all right? Okay, so uh, this two system, I mean, if one country two system works, it should succeed in maintain uh, uh, peace and uh, unity in Hong Kong. Okay, so uh, as you see, and I'm not gonna go through in detail, uh, the SAR um, does enjoy a very high uh, legislative and, and administrative and particularly judicial uh, autonomy. Uh, but also notice, however, that such autonomy is authorized by NPC, uh, our national legislature. Okay, so it's, it's you know, uh, two sides of the same coin, just like one country, two system uh, is a two sides of the same coin. Uh, there is autonomy, but this autonomy is given, is authorized. So there, there's inherent limits to such autonomy. If this, well, you know, if we have wise national leaders, then the autonomy would be uh, preserved. But if the leaders are not so wise, then uh, it is very much in question, uh, like it is not. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and you can also, you can see from the limits of, um, the SAR autonomy and well, you know, um, the, the, the debate I just uh, mentioned earlier, that is what's the nature of basic law itself is, uh, um, you know, it indicates uh, the limit in the basic law itself because basic law after all is made and to be amended by National People's Congress, and also under very strict condition, under supermajority, almost impossible. Okay, so um, so far the basic law has been uh, amended uh, very few times, and uh, in my memory, if I'm not mistaken, uh, never once was proposed by Hong Kong itself. It's always initiated by the central government, i.e. by the party. Okay, because the party wanted to amend. And as we've seen, the recent amendment is, has not been friendly to Hong Kong's autonomy. Okay, so, uh, but if Hong Kong wants to 
a man, the uh, a man, it's constitution, i.e. basic law, in its own favor, it has to follow very strict standards. Above all, it has to be sanctioned by the party, uh, the party state, um, which is possible only in very favorable conditions. Okay, so that's the inherent limit of uh, the SAR autonomy. And uh, you know, from these pictures, you can also see the relationship between the top leaders in mainland and the local leaders in uh, Hong Kong. And uh, you know, this is um, the current chief executive, uh, Lin, uh, uh, Mrs. Lin Zhen, um, who report to uh, President uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, and uh, from this, you know, just from this posture, you can see that, that uh, there isn't a whole lot of autonomy there. And the Hong Kong people reasonably worried about um, uh, the, um, you know, the, the uh, infringement of uh, autonomy uh, through different uh, uh, roads from administrative, from legislative, and even judiciary. Uh, because uh, the uh, Hong Kong judiciary is given the power to interpret its, its own basic law and its all the laws. But also notice that such power is given, okay? And uh, if it can be given, it can also be taken away uh, by National People's Congress and uh, its standing committee, okay? And the standing committee uh, is, has, is a final auditor of the interpretation of the basic law, not the final, the court of final appeals in Hong Kong, okay? But, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, okay? And there has been a couple of confrontations since 1999 um, in terms of who has the ultimate power uh, to interpret basic law. And uh, it has been very clear that it is a Standing Committee and um, not a Court of Final um, Appeals. So that really raised uh, reasonable worries about uh, Hong Kong's autonomy, all right? Okay, uh, I'm not going to get into the details except by uh, mentioning uh, all these uh, limits. And uh, very lately, there has been uh, debates and worries about the um, Hong Kong's legislative council. It's a, uh, uh, I mean, it's Congress or it's Parliament. Uh, what the, <clears throat> well, the election of the legislative council and the chief executive has been the area of the, the, the major source of the conflict between mainland central government and Hong Kong, okay? Because as we see, Hong Kong, you know, is governed by rule of law and uh, which is respected by and large by the central government. And uh, it has also the freedom guaranteed by basic law, okay? What it does not have is democracy, right? Uh, based upon one person, one vote for chief executive and the legislative council. Uh, they are elected by uh, uh, election method, which, which is grossly disproportional to, to its population. Uh, so it's certainly uh, seriously violating uh, the uh, one, con uh, I mean, one person, one vote. Uh, criteria. And uh, uh, ironically, uh, the conflict uh, uh, aggravated since mainland wanted to uh, improve its electoral method toward democracy because uh, this is the promise in basic law. So National People's Congress want to reform the basic law in order to, you know, make the election system more fair. But then because of lack of mutual trust, it want to tighten the selection process for the candidate, which is probably uh, make things worse, not better. Okay, so uh, that causes uh, massive protests back in uh, 19, uh, 2015, and again uh, in 2019. Okay, so um, unfortunately, the the, uh, the um, the benign reform did not occur, uh, but it moved to the opposite direction, all right? And the latest 
news is uh, uh, bad news because uh, the election and we see the massive protest, which is turned into uh, violent unrest, which is not good for the future of Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, uh, also under the COVID situation, uh, it was used as an excuse for delay. The electrical elections to this year, uh, because now the central government has the uh, time to uh, to to, to uh, modify the election method uh, so much so that uh, the pan democratic forces were totally excluded from the pre pre selection committee. Okay, so this is a very bad situation for uh, Hong Kong. Uh, which I don't know, which hopefully will not last forever. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, in the foreseeable future, uh, I cannot really see the, um, um, any uh, ground for, for optimism. Um, and uh, ironically, uh, because uh, the institutional reform has been, you know, uh, moving to the wrong direction, the independent uh, force in Hong Kong has been growing because uh, before, you know, even though we have some conflicts, but we don't see uh, uh, much support for Hong Kong independence. But because we deprive the right, uh, the democratic, right of the uh, Hong Kongese, um, they have reason to, to, you know, to become more radical and appeal to the more radical um, um, ideals. So we are in a vicious cycle. Uh, hopefully, uh, somehow, someday we would uh, um, end this vicious cycle and return to the um, virtuous cycle. Um, I think my time is about up, and let me just conclude uh, by saying that, um, first of all, we should be clear that unity is a big deal, okay? And I'm, you know, um, I, how should I describe myself? Uh, I probably should call myself a liberal. Um, you know, I support the, 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 the liberal unity position, okay? So, so we probably should invent a, a name for this stand. Uh, so unity is a good thing if it is based upon uh, constitutional democracy, but it is not the only thing, okay? Um, it, 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 from our Chinese perspective, uh, forced unity is very costly and um, uh, unstable, okay? So uh, this is not something uh, we really want, and uh, the unity would not be able to maintain in such a situation anyway. So sustainable unity is only based upon social contract honored by uh, a majority or vast majorities of citizens uh, in, you know, made of different ethnicities, or, uh, different um, uh, political you know, uh, geographies, who are willing to follow what I call the political natural laws, which include, uh, among other things, local autonomy, uh, probably implies some kind of federal or even super federal arrangements, um, ethnic equality and respect for religious and cultural freedoms. So people would, have, would feel comfortable, stay in this unified arrangement and have no reason uh, to break out. Okay, I think that's a very uh, simple and commonsensical logic. It's just unfortunate uh, that uh, how many countries in this world, um, particularly China throughout its history, um, are unable to understand these uh, simple truths. Okay, thank you very much.